appreciate you joining us for this conversation tonight. This is a bit of a preview conversation of what you're going to see in our uh, pieces that are running tonight on the CW6 News at 10 and NBC3 News at 11. We've already posted uh, one version of our latest update on cnycentral.com. And uh, to catch you up to where we are, you may remember about a month ago or so, we did our first stories about the map of 1919, which was related to uh, the way that Syracuse looked in 1919. Uh, this, in fact, this is the map. You're looking at it there. Uh, I found this map in the National Archives where the city engineer, Henry C. Allen, in 1919 for Syracuse, um, had colored this map, and you can see the different shades of the coloring there. Uh, green and blue for the better neighborhoods, yellows for the working class neighborhoods, red for the, uh, the industrial neighborhoods, and then layered over it, which is really what makes it quite fascinating and a unique uh, historical artifact, is written the words, Irish descent, German descent, Italian, Polish, Jewish, and Negro. And Negro is written over the red-lined neighborhoods, which means that this is essentially the first government record that we know of in Syracuse associating with uh, African Americans and redlining, a term that started to take on more meaning the more the century developed, the more the decades uh, passed. What we're talking about in tonight's story is we're taking you uh, out of 1919, out of the 1930s, into the 1940s and the 1950s, where federal programs now had moved into lending for mortgages and uh, issues of race related to that and prohibiting African Americans from being able to get loans to either improve the homes where they lived or to try to move on and better themselves. But also we get into urban renewal and what happened in Syracuse. Uh, some of the projects that took place, the, the first project was 1956, the Triangle Block in Syracuse, which I don't know if it's really a coincidence. It was right across from Syracuse City Hall, just kitty corner as you go out what is now the front door of City Hall. Uh, a block that's now the former 9X building, which has been converted into brand new upscale apartments, uh, multi-level building, was uh, a block bisected by Genesee Street back then and had within it some, uh, some tenements that included uh, quite a few African-American residents. And that was one of the first areas that was torn down. In fact, it was the first block. So you're going to see pictures of that coming up tonight in our, in our piece uh, on our late newscasts. And then we also are um, talking about the urban renewal that took place then later in the 60s and the early, into the early 70s where some, something in the range of $25 million was spent, federal government money used to tear down structures, some substandard housing, some uh, vital businesses in the African-American community, largely in what is described as the 15th Ward, which cleared out the property where 81 came through right parallel to Almond Street and then also near Townsend and McBride Streets, making way for the public safety building to be built, the Everson Museum to be built, uh, and Presidential Plaza and the offices that took place there. So, so there's quite a bit of uh, change that took place in our community during that time. That's part of what we're talking about tonight. We're also talking about the covenants which are within... Uh, the deeds and the abstracts that homeowners would see. In fact, tomorrow night we're, we're interviewing a current property owner who was quite surprised to see the covenants in her property today that are still in the historical abstract, which prohibit the property from being sold to black families. Um, and that was common in the near outer suburbs of the city of Syracuse and also the the areas outside of downtown, for example, um, Scott Home over on the east side of Syracuse, there's homes that had those covenants in there with that type of prohibition. So it's an important historical element to understand that there were actual policies in place to keep African Americans from being able to move outside of the red-lined neighborhoods within the city of Syracuse. And again, this is the map of 1919. You can see some of those red lines. As the maps were 
uh, changed and converted by the Homeowners Loan Corporation in the 1930s and then used by the FHA. Those red areas uh, increased in size and went, went out a little bit further. Um, and then also in tonight's stories, we're talking, we're using a bit of oral history, which is really fascinating to listen to. Uh, audio conversations recorded in the early 1980s. So now, 35, almost 40 years ago, these interviews were done of people that were actively involved in the civil rights efforts of the 1960s, which included efforts to to be able to um, try to hold off on, on the removal of black families from, from the center of the city of Syracuse. But what we learn in, in our investigation, and, and I'll uh, play this little bit of an interview here with Bob Searing from the Onondaga uh, Historical Association, that a conversation I had with him some time ago now regarding the map. Uh, but we talk about how all these various things, redlining, covenants and deeds, urban renewal, all was a concerted effort to move the black population in what turned out to be primarily the south side of Syracuse and creating segregation that really still exists today. Uh, but let's listen a little bit about it. Moved out to where the workers did, to DeWitt, to Fayetteville, mm -hmm. right, um, out yeah. that way. So what was left in the city were either people who lived there by choice, and that wasn't, you know, a lot of folks back then, but it was people who had no other place to go. Again, not because they didn't want to go somewhere else, but because they literally couldn't get a loan to move somewhere. Um, and one of the, you know, one of the things I think is worth uh, talking about, and I'll certainly can send this to you uh, for you to peruse sure. at your leisure, um, was a uh, core, the Congress of Racial Equality, had a chapter here in Syracuse that was yeah. founded in 1961. In 1964, um, they put together an incredible document called Project 101, mm -hmm. and essentially it laid out a hundred um, and one policy proposals to try to deal with the interconnected problems of racial segregation, employment discrimination, housing segregation, and, and educational segregation, which really had led to um, tens of thousands of people, mostly African American, but also, you know, some just poor um, other ethnicities, poor white folks living in these left, basically people that were left behind by that great post-war boom. Um, you know, and I think that oftentimes that those stories are forgotten because people aren't here, sort of out of sight, out of mind. The, you know, people tell me stories all the time about going into Salina Street to shop for Christmas, going to Dave Brothers Tea Room and Addis Brothers and, and you know, hanging out down there, going to, you know, the, the bookstore there, economy bookstore. That stuff basically stops by the 70s. And, you know, if you ask anybody that was in Syracuse to go to Armory Square in the late 1970s, 1980s, they weren't going to be hanging around there, right? Right. So everyone's out in the shopping malls, killed downtown. So, so it really is this sort of uh, unintended consequences, certainly, I think, for the folks that thought it would breathe life in the city and then all sides of other unintended consequences too for, certainly for the for the thousands of african-american uh, families in syracuse that are essentially forced into an even smaller ghetto um 90 percent of the black population is living you know in a series of just a few blocks over here on the south side and again that that's not an accident that's that's a historical process at play um policy decisions made by elected officials um in conjunction with bankers um and again so some 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 folks got to live the american dream and and uh, a lot of other folks did not have that opportunity and and here we are uh, about five years now since that the study was collated by the uh, Paul Jaworski down in, in at Rutgers uh, saying that Syracuse was leading the country in concentrated poverty for African Americans and Hispanics now, and and not doing that well for poor whites either in terms of concentrated poverty. Uh, but but he came up here and I walked some of these neighborhoods with. I want to transition back out of that and get back to some of your comments here that I see coming in. I see uh, MC Andrew Love saying that he grew up on the Southwest Side in the 80s. I, I, MC, I'd like to hear more about what that was like uh, for you. What was your experience? Share that with us a little bit. Linda's saying, I was a real estate agent years ago when studying for my license. There was and is a federal law that states it's against the federal law to redline. Real estate agents can only ask people where they want to live and what kind of amenities. This is only dividing us more. This is not helpful. Well, Linda, that is true. There has been a federal law for a long time, but also for a long time after uh, we're going to show you this, in fact, in our piece tonight. The official National Realtors Policy 
was back in 19 in the 1920s initially established and I'm going to I'm actually going to read it for you if I can find it here fairly effectively um, see if I can it, it it was an explicit policy by the National Association of Realtors Code of Ethics which said that that people uh, real estate agents uh, here it is a realtor should never be instrumental in introducing into a neighborhood a character of property or occupancy, members of any race or nationality, or any individuals whose presence will clearly be detrimental to property values in that neighborhood. So that goes back to pre-World War II, but that was the explicit policy given to real estate agents. And by the 1950s, that had been changed as their policy, uh, but but that still continued to be a practice that was continued. And in fact, uh, Newsday on Long Island did an investigation undercover just two years ago with uh, extensive um, people going in, posing as property owners, and they found out that it did still matter whether you were a black or white as to which neighborhood you were steered to, how you were treated when you came in the door, whether you needed to fill out paperwork or not. Uh, if the the 52-year-old white woman with a good education, a good salary, looking to buy a home, she didn't even have to fill out paperwork. The real estate agent took her out the door right away and went to work trying to find a home in a certain neighborhood. If the African-American woman came in same profile except for different complexion, uh, she was asked to fill out paperwork. Let me, let me get some ID from you. Why don't you come back tomorrow, make an appointment? So there's more subtlety to it the way it works today compared to the way it worked decades ago. That is true, thankfully. But we also need to understand where we came from and how our community and others like it across the country were set up to have essentially an, an interior, the city, uh, city of Syracuse being... Uh, where most of the black people live compared to the suburbs where most mostly white people live. And that's important to understand that there are a lot of government policies in play that led to that occurring. Um, if we are to understand how we need to do something about it to better integrate and create a more uh, desegregated community. Oceana is saying this is helpful because it explains to people who don't understand how it came to be this way and why a lot of people of color are still suffering in these areas because of the practices that affected generations. Oceana, you, I couldn't sum it up better than what you just said, so thank you. Uh, MC saying so many things changed over the years. Investors started buying up property, a.k.a. slumlords. Sure, that is true. Um, Rick saying that the media spreads hate every day. Media is trying to divide everyone. No, we're not, actually. Linda saying it's still against the law. They should be prosecuted. Yes, Linda, you are right that it is against the law. And it is important to understand that this does not mean all real estate agents today are doing this by any stretch. And I'm not implying that, and I don't want anybody to think that. But there are some that are still doing it today. And even if everybody does it right from this point forward and follows the law perfectly, we know there were policies in the past that set up the framework that we're still living with today, which I think is important when it comes to um, schools that we have, uh, higher segregation level within the Syracuse City Schools than we've seen in decades. And again, we're not alone in this. Syracuse is not unique in, in being, uh, having to deal with the vestiges of a segregated community set up through various government policies. Um, I had an interesting conversation today with a, an expert in the education field who is very concerned that nobody's talking about this and nobody's bringing it up and nobody seems to care about making any changes despite the Supreme Court and so on in 1954 saying um, separate cannot be equal by definition, yet today we're, we seem to think that separate is fine and, and we'll just try to make it equal if we can as opposed to doing something to not be as separate. MC saying, uh, thanks for coming on live. I truly appreciate your platform. We must make changes. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that, that comment from all of you tonight. I, I really do. Um, it is helpful to know that uh, we've got a dialogue going, and, and it's not an easy dialogue to have, and there certainly will be pushback to the stories that we air and the discussions we have here. 
but I think it's really important that we have those, those conversations. And, and, and as Oceana, I think it was, who said, that those of us who didn't understand the fundamental way our community got to where we are today get a better understanding of it. Um, a, a good, here's a good comment I want to bring up here. Melissa's saying, when I first saw the map info about all this, it caused me to look it up, and I saw that it happened all over our nation. Melissa, you are exactly right. You are exactly right. The HOLC maps were created in the 1930s. Now, the map we're talking about here initially that got this whole dialogue going here goes back to 1919, which makes it quite unique. In fact, there's a man, Kenneth Jackson, who wrote the book Crabgrass Frontier about the building of the suburbs in the United States in the uh, post-war era, uh, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. He's the one, he's the guy who walked into the National Archives in the mid to late 1970s and happened to be, uh, happened to see the residential security map books, which are the maps that you're referring to, Melissa, that were created in cities across the country by the Home, Ownership, Home Owners Loan Corporation, then used by the FHA uh, in backing loans, uh, deciding who got mortgages, assigning a, deciding a system of appraisal across the country that was very effective in creating a housing market and delivering the American dream to families that were, were essentially white families and explicitly excluded black families from being allowed to participate in that American dream. And Melissa is correct that this happened in cities all across America. There's a great site um, through Richmond University. They've done a great digital mapping of every, they've taken those historical red line maps and created a site, which I believe we have links to on our website, and I'll, I'll get those posted there. Um, it's worth noting that we have a special section set up for our segregated Syracuse coverage on our cnycentral.com site, where you can uh, go there and read all the stories that are now starting to accumulate that we've been covering regarding this. Um, Linda's saying, you know, we cannot change the past. All we can do is do better now. Linda, that's a really good point. And, and that's why it's important to talk about it and understand that just saying nothing and not understanding it doesn't move us forward at all. Um, uh, Linda's saying most of the places that are in horrible are rented places. They can't buy it. Um, Rick saying, how does it exclude black families? I'm not sure exactly which part you're talking about, Rick, but, but what we know is that, there, that banks and lenders uh, had either the HOLC maps or access to them or their own maps, and they would mark off areas and and say we are going to, if it was in a red neighborhood, it was their explicit policy documented on paper that they would have no mortgages in a redlined neighborhood, no lending to a redlined neighborhood. If it was a yellow neighborhood, one step up, they would go maybe 10 or 20% on a mortgage, and then the blues and the greens would do better. Keep in mind, here's another element to learn. Back before these federal governments were started, during the Depression, during the administration of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the average person couldn't even get a mortgage. You had to be fairly well off, and you'd have to put down, say, 50% of the price of the home and then borrow the money on a fairly short-term basis, five years, maybe 10. It wasn't until these programs got going and, and a system was established where the borrowing could go, now, go out to, say, 20 or 30 years, which has become common for us, to make that monthly payment more affordable for the average person. But black families were explicitly excluded. In addition, the Levittown development in Long Island is a great example of this, of a classic suburb built en masse. And they were there, the reason that suburb worked, and others like it in our own area, they were backed by the Federal Housing Administration, FHA. FHA said, we will only back the mortgages for you to build those houses if you exclude um, on the basis of race. That was their policy. So these were explicit government programs that excluded people based on race. Uh, really important to understand that. And, and really detrimental. Um, I want to get to, uh, I said that I'd bring up, we talked about the HOC maps. Um, race was a really important part 
And here's a description of, of a neighborhood. This was the 15th Ward in Syracuse. And let's see, it's probably too much work to bring it up to show you, but I'll read it to you. A very mixed area housing predominantly Jewish and Negro families. Low flat land near the center of the city with good schools, churches, and transportation. Section abuts Syracuse University to the south. Areas old and congested in disrepair with evidence of vandalism. Undesirable both as to the improvements and the class of occupant. So... That's based on, look, they're saying the schools are good, the churches are good, the transportation is good. It's right near the university, but we're still not going to lend there because of the undesirable nature of the class of occupant, which refers, in this case, to Negro and Jewish families. So there's discrimination explicitly in those policies. <clears throat> Linda, I, I'm, I'm glad you're defending realtors, and I do appreciate that. Thank you. As I said, that is not. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. That is not intended to say that that whatever is happening today in the world is is being executed by all realtors by any stretch. Melissa asking, I've wondered why they're called wars. That's a good question. That was just the, that was a term that uh, was a defining space within a city. Um, that was a structure, a fifteenth war, the sixteenth war. <clears throat> excuse me, my voice is getting a little bit dry. I might have to wrap this up. Um, and Linda were talking about rented places in those areas. They had landlords who should be held responsible. Certainly, that's important too. Um, they they should be held responsible. Landlords are are also uh, a group that needs to be held accountable. I, I guess we're seeing that at, at the Skyline Apartments right now on James Street too, aren't we? Um, due to the scratchiness of my voice. Just from talking to all of you nice people, I want to wrap this up here. But uh, tune in tonight on the CW6 News at 10. You're going to see the next installment of this. I appreciate all your comments. I'll continue to read those on our Facebook page here. Also on NBC3 News at 11, you'll see our latest installment of the map, Segregated Syracuse, and there'll be more to come following this. So thanks very much for joining me on our, this Facebook Live tonight. Appreciate your comments, your uh, you're shedding a lot of light from many angles, and I do appreciate that. Have a great night. We'll see you later on.